From far and wide Oilers fans, this is Dolany TV. And welcome back to another Edmonton Oilers game breakdown reaction, whatever the hell you want to call it here on Dolany TV, guys. I'm Tyson. Let's get right into another overtime loss. And this time again against another Eastern Conference opponent. Yes, you know what? Okay, fine, Dandy. Things look good. We had the lead going into the third period. Well, you know what? There's kind of that joke on social media. I saw a couple guys, World Hockey Report, tweeting about it as well. Sean McKenzie really did ask the Oilers, Leon Dreisaitl, going into that third period, the minute intermission interview, what are you going to do to make sure what happened yesterday doesn't happen again today? Well, guess what? They did the exact same damn thing. Give up a goal, ties the game. Okay, well, you know what? We still have a chance in overtime. McDavid Dreisaitl, that's almost 100%. Guess what? They did everything they could. Nurse drills the puck from the point and it just doesn't go in. And sure enough, Following up Darnell Nurse, who's the next defenseman out there? Man, it can't happen two in a row. No, no chance. No chance it happens two in a row. Well, guess what? Chris Russell makes an absolute clown out of himself, and the Oilers lose for the second straight day this weekend in overtime. That's absolutely ridiculous. If you're Ken Hitchcock and you saw how incompetently Chris Russell played that puck, which led to the zone time yesterday and the goal for the Philadelphia Flyers. Well, guess what? Why in the hell would you throw Chris Russell out there again today against a, well, in my opinion, a much speedier Montreal Canadiens team and think for a second you're going to have different results. I have absolutely no clue what is going on with the coaching in three on three overtime the past two days. Russell, love him to death, but he's your guy who just sits in the defensive zone and blocks shots. That's what he gets paid $4 million a year to do. Is it an overpayment? Well, it's a Peter Shirelli type contract, so you can make of it what you will. However, you do not stick him out in a speed gun and run game and hope he holds his own because guess what? Two days in a row, he proves he's not going to do it. Yes, you can you can argue what you want. Having Chase on take a face off in three on three overtime when possession is key. Fine, dandy. But for Chris Russell to sit there and take on a guy like that and try and force him to his forehand, what in the like? Come on, man. The defensive incompetence. That's what it is at best, guys. At best. That play by Russell is defensive incompetence. That is basic hockey 101. It was talked about three or four times in the broadcast on Hometown Hockey on Sportsnet today about how important it is to avoid the forehand puck handling when you're talking about the dangerous team that is the Montreal Canadiens. They were talking about making sure Weber doesn't receive it on the power play on his forehand because guess what? That's going to lead to a shot that's going to be very dangerous. Same thing in overtime. Russell forces his man to the forehand and it's bar down, back of the net, game over in overtime for the second day in a row. Okay, you know what? I'm going to take a break because I am angry enough about it as is. Let's just sit here, relax, and go over the stats because again, it was a great effort by our Oilers. They went down twice in a row, battled back, got the lead, gave up the lead, lost in overtime. That's kind of the story of the game. So before I get to the points, that's what you guys don't really come for because normally you've already watched the game or you've looked at the stat sheet. That's fine. That's Danny. I'm here to bring you beyond the stat sheet. A couple of big things. I've got about 10 things on my list here that I really want to run down in the next seven, eight minutes or so. Adam Larson. You know what, I, I crapped on him over the All-Star break because I feel his contract is an overpayment for what we are getting offensively and a little bit defensively. Today, he looked like a man most times without a clue out there on the ice. The next point I have, which I will extend onto this one, Larson and Dreisaitl both took a penalty for overplaying the physicality required. Those are dumb penalties. Dry settles penalty early in the game. You can argue, yes, he was clearing Byron out of the way because it would have led to a dangerous scoring chance. Problem is, puck nowhere in the vicinity. 
You run a guy like that, you, you know what? I, I honestly think Byron kind of let it happen, right? Same thing as the embellishment call on Drysaddle. I think Byron really just, oh, Drysaddle's going to hit me. I better just crumple like a sack of potatoes. I think that's what happened. I'm an Oilers homer. That's fine if you disagree. However, still a penalty, still a dumb play by Drysaddle. Same thing with Larson behind the net, overplaying the physicality. That's something our Oilers team seems to have an issue with, is miss gauging the situations. I can't even talk. I'm so foaming at the mouth, so angry about the overtime. However, mis misgaging the opportunities and the situations is just a complete problem for the Oilers. I've already said that. Now, the one positive point I really want to get to, this is something I will cover hopefully tomorrow in a video, tomorrow evening when I get going on the video topics. This is my leading one for tomorrow. Lucic starting to do old style Lucic things. He's all of a sudden these past two games up on top of the lineup with McDavid and Ratty. He's starting to just change, right? He's changing that game. He's adapting to being a slower player, but starting to get smart. Now that power play goal, that really wasn't a power play goal, but everybody on the power play was out there. We had four forwards out there still after the power play had expired, so might as well still be a power play. What happened? Lucic gets hit in front of the net with the puck. Bing bang, dry settle buries it. That's Lucic being successful. If honestly I'm Darnell Nurse and you see Lucic standing up there lugging it in front of the net, why not shoot it at his feet, shoot it at his chest, try and get a bounce, buy a bounce. The Oilers have had such a tough time this year buying bounces, you might as well start creating them. And with Lucic, we created one today, and that could have been a difference maker. However, a point I want to make about Lucic, the past couple of games, he's been stepping up getting points. Guess what? The only game we've won of Lucic getting points is when he gets two points. Stupid. I know. We, we all complain, man, if Lucic could get some points, we might win some more games. Guess what? It hasn't worked, except for the game in which he got two points. Well, guess what? That's That's tough because it was the Buffalo game if I'm not mistaken. Anyway, already covered. Dry settles Johnny on the spot there with the Lucic assist. He was Johnny on the spot on the chase on a Nuge play and McDavid was also Johnny on the spot. So good two, three goals out of our guys. Problem is, again, all three of our goals come from McDavid, Dry Seidel. Oof. Other thing I don't have on my list, Darnell Nurse ties a career high in points. Good, go, great. Toby Reader. Let's get to him over this game. Toby Reader had two chances in this game. One kind of a partial break in which, again, whatever is going on with the hockey gods and Tobias Reader's stick, I have no friggin' clue. It is unreal the amount of chances Tobias Reader gets. And there's no way he is that bad of a player that he can't cash at least one. He continues the dry spell this season and somehow, someway, every glorious chance this guy gets, he buffs. I, I don't understand. It, it is just impossible. There is no way to explain it at this point. It's kind of what we were explaining with Lucic, although we knew things were wrong in Lucic's game. Reader uses his speed, strength, skill, everything that he can do to possibly buy a goal, and they just won't go in for him. It's unreal, guys. Absolutely unreal to see how unlucky, how uncoordinated some of these efforts coming out of Tobias Reader can be, and just pucks not rolling into the net, yet Ty Ratty can go in on Carter Hart, who's one of the up-and-coming best goaltenders in the league, and baffle a puck past him somehow. Tobias Reader's had 30 of those chances this season, not a one's gone in for him. Absolutely disheartening if you're Tobias Reader at this point. Now, it is absolutely brutal how this game went, because, well, you know what, we actually got good goaltending out of Koskinen. Koskinen at times had to stand on his head and again just guys not doing their job right. Chris Russell I hate to pick on him again he looked off the shot on that Shea Weber goal and tried to block it last second. If he would have stayed on with Weber and gotten his butt in the way a little bit more guess what we win this game 3-2-4-3 <laughs> who knows how we win this game, but that would have been an instrumental block. Pardon, yes, 
that it might have injured Russell and we might be without him and whatever. But Clef Baum Sekera coming back, that could be a blessing in disguise at some rate, some way, especially considering how the past two overtimes have gone. Just saying. So, Koskinen definitely showing flashes of being a playoff run goalie. Problem is, not going to happen this year. Again, another loss. Don't think it's going to happen unless we rattle off 9-10 in a row after this game. Probably not going to happen. Raddy, as I said, him, Lucic, and McDavid looking great as a top line. And that goes to my next marker down the list. I think that Hitch is really going to keep these lines together for a while. Things are going right. For the Oilers to lose back-to-back -back games in a crapshoot 3-on-3 overtime, and the only mistake, the only reason they lose those games is because they have Chris Russell on the ice in 3-on-3 overtime. Guess what? Bing, bang, boom. Things are actually going right in Edmonton, and today the power play gets going. That is huge. Pooley Arvey, you guys can make of it what you will, having him on the fourth line. Guess what? He is driving a line. Everybody makes such a big deal of Leon Dreisaitl having to drive his own line. Nobody is paying attention to Yesa Pugliarvi absolutely dragging two guys who are scrap pieces anywhere they play in the NHL at this point of their careers into an actual forechecking offensive threat two games in a row post All-Star break. I'm sorry, you can crap on Hitchcock for having Pugliarvi on the fourth line, but having him there elevates the play of those guys. I'd prefer him there instead of him with Nugent Hopkins and have Kazian on the fourth line and have a black hole other than when Brodziak and Kazian are out there penalty killing. Come at me, fire me in the comments, whatever you want to do, but that is my take on that and it is flaming hot for sure. Nurse cleft bomb definitely needs to happen when they get back. Nurse, career high in points. You know what? Let's go. Keep him rolling. Don't shuffle him down there. Doom him to play with Chris Russell. I don't want that to happen. Brutal if it does. And thank goodness, guys, this is where I want to close out on because this is absolutely an impossible one. Jeff Petrie, thank God he has a brain because we could be talking about a season and maybe a career lost if he would have finally finished off McDavid on that check. Thank goodness, Jeff Petrie. I saw on Twitter guys were thanking him once an oiler, always an oiler. No, that's just a guy with a hockey brain. You do that, you would never, ever, ever play your legit NHL game ever again because guys would just be coming to take your head off if you were that greasy. Guys, I'm Tyson. This is Stolen TV. A 4-3 overtime loss to the Montreal Canadiens. Two in a row post-All-Star break. The losing streak continues for the Edmonton Oilers. We'll see what happens next time out. I will catch you guys in the next one.